We continue our reading of God, uh, the Gospel according to Luke, starting in chapter 9. So, if you would like, you could uh, take your Bible and turn to chapter 9 as we read from God's Word. When Jesus had called the twelve together, He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave, as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on. And he was perplexed, because some were saying that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. So was the reading of God's holy word. Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that you open our hearts to your word. May your spirit flow in us. And may your message come to our hearts this day. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now Jesus says to his disciples, I'm going to send you guys on a journey. But don't pack your bags. You're not going to take anything with you. And he lists the things that he specifically doesn't want them to take. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no tunic. Now any traveler of that day would know that those are major things that anyone would need to take on a journey. But Jesus is saying, no, you can't take anything. How many of you have been backpacking or hiking or camping? Any of those. Probably everybody's at least done one. All right. Well, you know that if you're going to go out backpacking or hiking or camping, you you usually take the day before and you make a list of the things that you need to put in your in your bag or in your car. And you'll you'll make this a whole list of all the things I need to pack up and make sure and check them off. Say okay, make because there's nothing worse than to realize that you've got forgotten something once you're at the campsite. You open up your bag and oh, I don't have any food. And then, even worse, no toilet paper. Oh. And where's the water? And I don't have any matches? We're in trouble. Nothing worse than to forget something at home. And I know if you're anything like me, when I'm packing up to go someplace, I'm rushing and throwing everything in, and I'll get in the car and I'll take off, and I'm the whole, you know, for the first hour or so, I'm thinking, what did I forget? You know, I know I forgot something. I can't figure out what it is. And lo and behold, I usually do forget something back. But there is something to say for packing light. On my first uh, camp out, I guess you'd say, with the Marines, uh, the day before we were told to put things in our pack to, that we thought we would need along the, on the weekend with the Marines. So I was in there, shiny little chaplain there, brand new, had never been out with the Marines before, and I'm just throwing all types of stuff in there, you know, candy and all uh, granola bars and water, and I mean, just all types of stuff in there. And, and the sergeant major comes around and notices that I'm throwing a whole bunch of stuff in my backpack, and he kind of smiles at me, he looks, and he says, Chaplain, you realize we're going to be hiking 20 miles in. I would suggest you get some of that stuff out. (laughs) Well, thank God for the sergeant major because he was right. By the time I had lightened my pack, by the time I got to our destination, that light pack felt like a ton of bricks. And imagine if I had carried everything that I thought I needed along the way, it would have been dropped like little seeds all along the way out to the campsite. They would have been able to find us easily from all the stuff I would thrown out of the backpack. I came across a 
from a commentator uh, in regards to this particular passage. He said this, The more a man is cluttered up with material things, the more he is shackled down to one place. Now think about that. The more a person is cluttered up with material things, the more he or she is shackled to one place. Today, I believe, we clutter up our lives. We put a ton of stuff in our backpacks with commitments and meetings and events and activities and material things. So much so that when God calls us out to our villages to do God's work, we're too loaded down, we're too shackled to the one place, and we don't move. But let's get back to Jesus' request. No staff. But everyone knows that you need a staff for support along the bumpy roads, for protection from the wild animals and the thieves that will try to rob you. No bag. Then what do I do and how do I carry my supplies? Do I hold them all in my arms and walk around like this? You need a bag. Everybody knows you need a bag to put the stuff in. No bread. Well, now wait a minute. How am I going to eat? What am I going to have to, to bring nourishment to me? No money. Oh, now we're going a little too far. This was to purchase, purchase power to resupply. When you run out of supplies, you have some money in the next village. You could buy some more supplies and keep going. No tunic. Well, the tunic is for keeping protection from the winds and the storms. And you're wanting me to have no protection? I don't get it, Jesus. But Jesus insisted that they not bring any of those supplies. Anything that a true journeyman knew you needed to have in order to go on a long journey. And why did he do that? Because he expected the towns to supply what they needed. And he expected his disciples to go out in faith. That they would be taken care of. Jesus would not send them out on this journey without reassuring them that they would be taken care of by their God. Were they willing to take care of these disciples in order to receive the gifts they were bringing? It was a test for the villages. Also, taking care of a stranger is a sign of welcome in the Middle Eastern culture. And if these villages were not going to show true welcome to a stranger, then they're not worth talking to. Jesus strongly says, if people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. What does he mean by that? Well, you see, the shaking off of dust from your feet is an insult in Middle Eastern culture. It's a sign of disgust. For those of you who have been deployed uh, or have been on any caravans, you will learn or learn about the culture of the Middle East out there. And one of the things that they would do to show a sign of disgust for our troops that were coming through in a caravan, the older men would be all sitting down on the ground visiting. And as our caravan goes through, they would have the bottom of their feet face towards us. That's basically telling them, we don't want you here. It's a symbol of shaking the dust off your feet. And I think we need to learn that lesson today. We need to learn to shake the dust off our feet. When we go out into the villages that God is calling us to go to, meaning when we go out to encounter the people that God wants us to visit with, they won't all welcome us. And we need to learn the art of shaking the dust off our feet. Sometimes we're too stubborn and we won't do it and we keep trying and keep trying. There are people whom we cannot reach no matter how hard you try. Maybe the time isn't right. Maybe you're just not the right person. Maybe their heart is too hardened. But no amount of pushing is going to help. Shake the dust off your feet and move on. Because there will be someone out there that God will bring to you. Now, why was Jesus even sending them out in the first place? Well, think about it. They have no TV. They don't have a radio. They don't have Internet. They don't have Facebook. They don't have blogging. And what is it, Twitter, cell phones. They don't have any of that stuff. So how do they get the message out? I mean, if Jesus continued to go from place to place by himself, well, with his disciples, and they just went to one place at a time, 
It would take forever to get out to the, all the villages the message that he wanted to get. So he decided, according to the Gospel of Mark, he decided to send his disciples out in twos. So they could spread out a whole area. If we were going to get message out about our church, if we had everybody go to the same house each time, we would never get the message out. So we'd send everybody out to various houses and various neighborhoods to get the message out. It's a quick way to get it out. Well, what was Jesus asking His disciples to do in, this, in these villages? Two things. Pro- proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. And what does He mean by proclaim the kingdom of God? The people have been longing and longing for God to come and bring in His kingdom. The people were crying out for the Messiah. And He was calling for His disciples to tell the people that the kingdom is here now. Jesus has come. Jesus is bringing in the kingdom. And the Messiah that they've been all longing for is now here. God has sent His Son to be among them and bring them back to God. Preach that. And then heal the sick. Now this is an interesting translation. The word that He uses for heal, yes, can be translated to cure, restore, make whole. But it also can be translated as take care of. And in the Latin version of this particular text, they use the word take care of. And the word that they use for sick is not necessarily ill or a disease. It's translated weak, feeble. In other words, he was sending them out to heal and cure diseases, but he was also sending them out to take care of the weak, to take care of the feeble. So who are the weak? Who are the feeble amongst us? It could be someone whose husband recently left her and she has nowhere to go. It could be someone like when we were singing in the hymn, someone whose dreams have been, have been dashed and they don't know what to do next. It could be someone who has absolutely no friends Someone who recently has been raped and doesn't know how to talk to anybody about it. They're embarrassed. Someone who has always been made fun of. And you know, bullies in high school and middle school grow up to be adult bullies. And there are people that are bullied as adults too. And you've seen them. The ones that everyone makes fun of. When I was in high school, um, I was on the football team. And, um, you know, I wasn't any star. I was just on there and had a good time playing around with the guys. But we had this one fat kid. Everybody called him the fat kid on the high school football team. And he was the one that everybody picked on. Before the coach got out on the field, we are out there supposedly stretching. He was the one that was pushed around. He was the one that was tripped. He was the one that was teased about being so fat. He, he was the one that was thrown down in the mud whenever it rained and there was a mud puddle. We'd throw him, they'd throw him down in the mud. They'd grab him by his mask and they'd drag him around by his mask. He committed suicide one night after practice. Now, I never participated in the bullying, but I never spoke up. I'll never forget that. I never spoke up. A former member of our church many years ago was raped one night. She didn't have anyone of family in this neighborhood in in San Antonio. She didn't know who to go to, who to talk to. She found herself in the kitchen one night talking to my wife, Denise. And she finally shared what had happened to her. Now, I don't know what Denise said to her and um, and Denise doesn't even remember what she said to her. But this woman left our church to go visit with, stay with family for a few years after this particular event. And then she came back for a short period of time. And she told me about this story. And she said that your wife is the one that took care of me, listened to me, when I was too afraid to share what had happened. Denise that night took care of of the feeble, the vulnerable, the weak. And she doesn't even remember it. Sometimes I believe we hesitate 
to help and to reach out because we don't feel adequate or courageous enough to reach, to reach out and to help someone or to listen to someone. The disciples did not have anything in their bag. They didn't even have a bag. But the disciples did, did everything that God called them to do and they conquered the world. You know, you don't have to have much in your bag in order to show kindness or to befriend someone. You used to have to have a heart and a little courage. In 2000, there was a story that was introduced on the Internet. Some of you have probably read it. It's been going around for years. It's the story of Kyle. And I'd like to share with you the inside of this story. It's given by the young man who knew Kyle. And he says this, One day when I was a freshman in high school, I saw a kid from my class walking home from school. His name was Kyle. It looked like he was carrying all of his books home, barely able to hold on to them. I thought to myself, why would anyone bring home all his books on a Friday? He's got to be a nerd. Now, I had a quite a weekend plan, parties and football games and hanging out with my buddies in the afternoon on Saturday. And as I was walking, I saw a bunch of kids running up towards Kyle, and they they ran right into him and knocked all his books out of his arms. His glasses flew off his face and flew off into the grass. He looked up at me, and I saw a terrible sadness in his eyes. I felt sorry for him, so I jogged over to him, and as he crawled around looking for his glasses, I helped him pick up his books. And then I found out that he lived not too far from me, and I said I'd help him carry his books home. And we took his books home. He invited me in, and we spent an afternoon. Actually, we spent the whole weekend being with each other. He turned out to be a pretty cool kid. I asked him if he wanted to play football on Saturday with me and my friends. He said yes. And, and like I said, he, he hung out all weekend, and, and we had, I got to know Kyle more and more, and I really liked him. And over the next four years, Kyle and I became the best friends. When we were seniors, we began to think about college. And Kyle was planning on going to med school and going off to Georgetown. And I was going off to Duke to study business on a football scholarship. Now, Kyle was the valedictorian of our class. And he was designated to give the valedictorian speech. He had prepared a speech for this graduation, but he was nervous. And I noticed that he was nervous. So I went up to him and I slapped him on the back and said, Kyle, you're going to do fine. I know you're going to do great. Now as he started his speech, he cleared his throat and he began in this way. Graduation is a time to thank those who helped you make it through those tough years. Your parents, your teachers, your siblings, maybe a coach. But mostly your friends. And I'm here to tell all of you that being a friend to someone is the best gift you can give them. I'm going to tell you a true story. And he just looked right down at me, and in disbelief, I heard him tell the story of how he met me on that first day. You see, he had planned to kill himself over the weekend. He had talked of how he had cleaned out his locker so his mother would not have to come home, come back and clean out the locker of his son who had gone. But thankfully, I was saved. My friend saved me from doing the unspeakable. Now, some of you have probably heard that story. And legend has it that this story really has been embellished over the years. It's a much bigger story than it truly started out to be. It's originally a story found in the book Chicken Soup for the Soul. And it it was a chapter entitled A Simple Gesture. And yes, it was about two boys... But it didn't quite turn out with the valedictorian speech and everybody crying and all that kind of hoopla. It just built to that. The real story is that it was Bill and Mark. And Bill's books were not knocked out of his arms by bullies. He simply just tripped over his two feet and they fell all over the place. Bill and Mark do share a Coke that afternoon, but they do not spend the weekend. They do not become best friends. They're just acquaintances. Bill did not reveal his secret in a valedictorian speech. He privately shared it with Mark. But does this new information about this story take away from the power of the simple gesture? Does it? 
a life was still saved. I give you a real life story at an event where I was and I, and I experienced. I had taken a youth group up to New Wilmington Missionary Conference in Pennsylvania. And in the evenings, every evening, we would have evening vespers. And that's like sharing time and prayer time and sing a few hymns. And, and, and you'd have a speaker to kind of encourage you about the theme that we were working on. In the evening that we were there, one of the evenings, the main speaker was an All-American wide receiver for the University of Pittsburgh, the year the University of Pittsburgh was number one in the country. He was a dynamic speaker and a wonderful Christian man. And the sp- the sp- the topic was on brotherhood with others. Brotherhood with others. How to be a Christian brother with others around. And so they were beginning to talk about how can you be a Christian brother. And they were sharing about, well, I have my Christian brothers here, and we pray together before school. And another group was saying that we're going to start a prayer group. And another couple of guys stood up and said, well, we're going to start having Bible study after, after practice, you know, and so we can develop a, a bond, a true bond. And everybody was having all this wonderful, cozy time about how they were going to have, how they have this brotherhood already, and how special it is, and how important it was in their life. And then there was kind of a quiet moment, and one young boy stood up over in the corner, all by himself, sort of sitting on the side of the bleachers. It was a bleacher setting. He stood up and he said, I don't have any friends, and no one talks to me at school. If I wasn't there, I don't think anyone would even know or care. And then a football stud stood up who went to his school. And he said, you got a friend now. And he ran down out of the bleachers. And he grabbed a hold of that kid and gave him a big hug. And you know what amazingly happened after that? The whole bleachers left. They came down and surrounded this young boy and prayed for him and encouraged him. Now, I don't know if they carried well, on with their theme of, be, of being a true friend. But what I saw that night, I guarantee you that kid had friends when he went back to school. You don't have to have much in your bag to show kindness or to befriend someone. You just have to have a heart and a little courage. Let us pray. Gracious God, I know that that we want to go to the villages that you sent us out to. Sometimes we just fill our bags too full with stuff that we can't move. I pray that you can help us relieve this load that we can begin to go out and to to befriend people. There are countless folks like this young man at New Wilmington, uh, like Mark and the others who had no friends and need friends. There are so many vulnerable people who need an arm around them to encourage them. And I pray that you help us do what you've called us to do as Christian brothers and sisters to care for those who are weak and feeble. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.